just got a message I've never seen before. It said, Craig is thinking. Oh, dear God, it's thinking now. <laughs> Soon it'll be plotting and then overthrowing. Oh, no. The AI, it's taking over already. Speaking uh, of AI, I got a cool thing I want to talk about. All but, right, but who, but who are you first? I'm Grumpy Dungeon Master Gore. I mean, Christopher. And I am Grumpy Dungeon Master Wog. I mean, I mean Jay. Cool. Yep. So what um, is what is this AI thing that you are I, going I show- to tell me about, even though I didn't watch whatever the fuck you linked? God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> I link you things that I'm going to talk about. It looked like a TikTok video. It was a TikTok video. That's That's why I didn't watch it. Well, watch it. It was it, it was from the Sly Sly Flourish. You know who that is, right? No. He's a D and D content creator and blogger, creative space person. Okay. Um, and involved in a lot of projects. Really, really cool guy. He did a full review on my Dread of the Ice Devil. Um, he was actually the first review I ever got. Oh yeah, know, okay. and actually gave re- back a yeah. lot of feedback. Yeah, I remember that. Amazing okay. guy. So you know, just at Sly Flourish on Twitter. He's always active on there. Um, but the TikTok thread that I sent you was from him posting that and pretty much, I guess, Notion, which is something I've just recently become involved with, basically how uses chat GPT to auto format text into the 5e standard. OK, OK, so he basically like grabbed a bunch of data, copied and pasted it into Notepad. All right. And then just paste it into to Notion that he was working on a bunch of monsters, and then basically gave the command to ChatGPT to format this as five to make it look like five E material, and it went through and it did all the bolding and formatting and spacing and typeface and put it all in the tables and stuff like that, so you could easily copy and paste it and move it wherever you wanted. Oh man! For- now see that. That is hot. That's useful, actually, for people like me, especially, who are never going to learn how to format shit properly. And if I, but, you know, I do like creating magic items and monsters and stuff like that. And having the ability to just say, here, do it for me. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I'm down with that. Yeah, really cool. Um, I'll link it in Discord for everyone to see. No, that's, that's awesome. Um, I like that. I like that AI can actually be used for something good. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, that's that's. I mean, I'm I'm all for that. Yeah. Join our Discord. Take a look at it. It's in the podcast chat channel. Yep. Uh, I, I wanted to talk about this thing. This other thing you linked that was not a TikTok video. The Dungeons and Dragons tribute set. Oh yeah. So um Oh my god, I want this so hard. I will the never DVD have tribute it. set. I mean, I don't know why not. Uh three hundred and eighty four dollars, that's why not. Okay, so the three hundred okay, so what is the Dungeons and Dragons tribute set? Someone out there uh went through and created STL files, okay? For all the original characters from the Dungeon and Dragons animated cartoon show. Yes. He then went as far as to create kind of like this really cool, like diorama base. So you could put all the characters on there and it has like the roller coaster and the Dungeons and Dragons dragon head on there and everything. So you could buy all these STL files. Okay. Make it and awesome. print them out at your printer. Okay. And it costs you like 20 bucks. Yeah, that's you fair. know, uh, not well, minus mi- minus the cost of the filaments and shit. Yeah, minus the cost of filaments, minus the cost of having a uh, yeah, 3D printer. Uh, yeah, all I of mean, that. I mean, those who have a 3D printer have a 3D printer. Yeah, but if you want to buy it already printed out and assembled, and I believe painted. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, at least this, the one I'm looking at, is definitely. Sorry, painted. yeah, it's it's not painted. Okay. But they'll print out the file, print out the the actual miniatures for you, and mail them to you, and that co- that costs three hundred eighty four dollars. Which, you know, at the end of the day, you're looking at let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight minis and a diorama. Yeah, it's oh, that's not that's, even 
the stuff you yeah. just listed isn't even the most important stuff on this photo that I'm looking at. What's that? The most important thing is the fucking dice from the 90s. I, I don't think that you get that. I think that's just what? part of the picture. What? This is false advertisement. That's the you're, re- you're really going to pay you pay for for one purple D20 and one red D10. Yeah, but they're old. They're old dice. They're not the new modern shit. These have like rounded curves on them, and they're they're sort of the the cheap see through shit that we had back then. They're beautiful. You can still get that today, man. <laughs> I know, but these are actually old. I could tell. Uh, I know my dice. I've been using dice for four to five years. I've been rolling dice. <laughs> Actually, I like them when they're soft and they don't hurt my hands. Exactly, yeah. Uh, no, so the, the minis are actually really fucking awesome. Uh, I did notice that all of the characters in the minis are, one, they are older than they were in the cartoon, and two, yeah. they're way more badass than they were in the cartoon. <laughs> yeah. Again, I have, I'll have a link to the printout module on our, our Discord, so um, you can take a look at it, that and let us know what you think. It is... Honestly, I, I like it. I wouldn't mind getting the STL files and then hitting up someone to print them out for me and then having someone paint them. But I would pay $1,000 for that thing sitting right there fully painted as it is. Can't can't argue with the... Uh, uh, what the hell was that noise? All right. That was a weird noise. You hear? I'm still here. Okay. Well, whatever, whatever the fuck Discord or Craig you're doing, I'm just going to ignore it now. So, yeah, I would definitely want that $384. Honestly, seems it's expensive, but reasonable for something like that. Uh, yeah. I, I have no display shelves. I have nowhere to put it. And if I had it, nobody else would ever see it because people don't ever come over to my house. That'd be kind of a waste. But maybe someday, someday. I mean, you get rich. <laughs> yeah, after I, after I have lots of money and we have a grumpy Dungeon Master Studios, we'll just display it in there. Yeah, then I can expense it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I know you have a lot of things that you want to discuss today. <clears throat> yeah. Um, the D&D Creator Summit. That's and the main. comments that's, that were main. That's the main. I honestly don't know anything about any of that. I had to go out and help our friend Eric with his LARP that he's running. He, he shot a commercial for it, and I he, he needed my help just to be an extra in it. So I volunteered, and I was away all weekend. And I guess this drama started maybe like Thursday or Friday, but I was focused on packing stuff and yeah, I th- getting out there. So I, I have no idea what it is. You're going to have to lead us through that. But I want to say, though, on the five-hour trip that I had there and back, all I did was listen to Ed Greenwood interviews. <laughs> awesome. And it was, it was amazing. I know now I probably now know more about him than I ever have in my time, at any point in time in my life. And I could probably recite to you the main question that everyone always asks. them. like, well, how'd you get into writing Ed? And I, I'm not going to repeat it. You can go watch the interview yourself and learn. Um, well, how, how did he get into writing? So when he was six years old, okay, his dad, who was some kind of like weird high end scientist in the military doing something with radar and nuclear something physicists or something like that, he would read all those books and all the pop novels that uh, pulp novels that they had up there. And he would finish reading it and then he'd run upstairs to his dad and like, Dad, this is great. Are there any more? And his dad would go, no, son, that author died in 1956. You're going to have to write out this next story yourself. And he would be like, okay. And he'd run downstairs and write out stuff all by himself. And that's, that's how he started getting directly. At six years old. That's actually amazing. And for somebody to, for somebody at the age of six to do that, he didn't have any friends. <laughs> well, it's it, it sounded like, I mean, he lives out in the middle of nowhere in Canada. And I'm pretty sure that, you know, as a military kid, it probably happened a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah. And honestly, everyone asks him that question. If I ever have him on to this, on, on the, our podcast, I will not ask him that question. I will just tell him that I already know. Yeah. And now, now <laughs> and everyone you... else, everyone else can go watch videos where he explains this thing very happily and very pretty much the same exact way to every single person that asked him that question. 
Now that and, you explained it to me, if I if we ever have him on the podcast, I'm going to ask him that question. Don't ask him that question. <laughs> but he he tells me now. He tells he tell me now. But he he was telling all the interviewers now, like they would ask him, like, "What do you do now?" and whatnot. And he's like, "Well, I just write for like 12 to 16 hours a day." Oh. Um. He stays at he stays at home and takes care of his wife. His wife is bedridden. Um, so he doesn't get out and do much or anything like that. So he just stays home and, you know, writes. writes. He has, he, he said that he has enough money that he could basically build the house, how he, his house, how out, how he wanted it. And he has six to eight different locations in his house where he can sit down and work on some kind of writing project. So six to eight different locations with its own separate computer its own separate monitor set up to his specifications, six chairs, all because he he has a lot of handwritten notes and physical books that he references a lot. Sure. And he doesn't want to mix those notes up. So he just uses the computer for Word, and that's it. And he uses books and uh, notes and sticky stuff all over the place and maps and, and junk and just organizes his, his desks <laughs> as his writing projects. Yeah, his six desks are all for separate projects. <laughs> and so what he says is like, you know, people are asking us like, what happens if you get burned out? He goes, I don't get burned out. I just, if I'm writing, you know, a D and D novel and I don't want to write it anymore because I feel like I'm tapped. I just get up out of this desk, go to another room, sit down and continue writing that next story, whatever it may be. Oh yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, cause I know he does a lot. He writes a lot of the, uh, I would imagine, I'm sure he still writes novels, uh, but I know he writes a lot of the other just D and D lore content so if you get tired yeah, of writing I, a novel you just go oh, i'm gonna go make some magic items or yeah right and people would lore. ask him questions about like current goings on in lore and he's like i know the answer to that but i can't tell you because it's nda yep, yep. and like i don't remember him being tapped for like any of the books and stuff for 5e well, yeah but if he may not be tapped but i guarantee him to you a lot of those authors and writers talk to him Maybe. I mean, who else would you go to to get arcane pieces of lore that you wouldn't know when you're trying to write something for Watsi? You go to the source. So, like, um, like the question I would ask him is, like, so you, you created Mert. Mert was one of your original characters. And Mert's now a mainstay character NPC in the Forgotten Realms. Well, the last official publication of Mert that I know of is from the Spelljammer Academy Adventure League write-up that was published on D&D Beyond. And Mert is the basically headmaster of that school. And there's an assassination attempt to put upon Mert that gets, that gets foiled by the students. So did he have any involvement with that, with that character? Because it's still his, and he can still do anything he wants with Mert. But that's where Mert is right now. Th- does he know that? Did someone ask him? Did they ask for permission for that? I'm sure. Can you do did. that? I-, I don't know. I, whether they asked permission or not, I'm I'm absolutely certain that there is. If they didn't ask permission, there's an agreement that would allow them to do that. And... Oh yeah, I mean, sure. There, I'm sure there's an agreement, but like, what if they killed off Mert there? You know. There are probably rules against that, I would assume. But yeah, no, that's a good question. I would love to kind of know the answer to that stuff, uh, especially after what I talked about last week, where he said, you know, that they don't, they can't do that without, you know, confirming with him first. Not that specifically, but uh, the other subject, whatever it was that I've already forgotten from last week. <laughs> <laughs> no, see, there is actually like, you know, uh, uh, there's a keeper of the lore at, at D and D, but you know, it's not him. How much people when, when it comes to forgotten? Already, yeah, I when mean, it comes to forgotten realms, are, why are they not always tapping him for? You know, well, he, he didn't. He didn't write everything. I, he, I know he didn't write everything, but if they're messing with stuff that he did write, like Mert, are they still tapping him? And if they are tapping him, he's not listed in the credits. Yeah, I'd be. I'd love to know the answer to these things. Just kind of see a little behind the curtain. How does the how does this really work? What agreement do they have? 
but you know that might be something that he's not ever going to talk about. Yeah. So who knows? Might have maybe there might be an NDA you know, agreement between them that they just he just doesn't discuss it. Yeah, and it, it sounded like he had a lot of like finality to a lot of the stories, and I understand why they'll never get those right and write those and publish those because you don't want to have finality to a, an adventure. You know, you kind of want to leave it open up. You give the DM wiggle room, wiggle room, as yeah. he said multiple times. But, you know, eventually there has to be some finality to the next couple of ages as, as things move forward. You know, like everything that's happened in 5e, this 1492 to 1496 DR window that we're working in. He, at Greenwood, is already working on stuff that happens at the start of 1500 DR and 1530 DR and 1550 DR. So he has all that stuff there. So are they going to be start moving into that with the, the newer editions? That seems to be when they make a time jump is when the next edition comes out. Yeah. Well, there are no next editions, according to Watsy. And then they can go fuck themselves because there absolutely is. Yeah. Yeah. OK, let, let's go ahead and get into this shit. Uh, we'll, All right. We'll, hold on. We, let me and, crack my knuckles. And we'll All start. Right. We'll start right there. So they did this past weekend. It was the Dungeons and Dragons Creator Summit. And they invited a whole bunch of content creators. Uh, some of them were YouTubers. Some of them were people who write, you know, uh, secondary products for D&D. And they invited a whole bunch of people paid their travel, paid their hotel, made sure they had food, paid them $300 on top of everything. This is the info that I've gotten. And then invited them out for a weekend and had a long discussion, revealed a few things, et cetera, et cetera, and then sort of got reamed for about four hours by a lot of these uh, creators, uh, which we'll come back to that. But mm-hmm. one of the one of the things they announced was that there will be no sixth edition D and D, and that <laughs> it will and that it will continue to be referred to as just D and D. Everybody knows good and damn well that the people who play this game, who are not involved in the creation of it or anything like that, are simply going to call it five point five. Because that's what it is when they're they're making a few modifications exactly like they did between third to three five. And everything after this year, after 2023, because next year is when this is supposed to be released, right? I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. So everything after the last book of this year will almost certainly just be referred to as 5.5 because that's how the players recognize you know, the, the separation of when, of where they were at then and where they are now. So the, the, the one thread that I saw on this, where there's a comment from Jerry, Jeremy Crawford stating that since 3.5 required that you replace your books, fifth edition is actually sixth edition. Technically. Does it not require you to replace your books? So fifth are edition, there, are there rules? According- <laughs> According to Jeremy Crawford and the developers and designers right now, you do not need to buy or replace any of your books when the new material comes out because the 5th edition player's handbook will still work and still be balanced for the new encounters and designs and stuff they have going forward. Are they releasing a new player's handbook? So, here's the thing. The math of the system, and I've said this before, the math of the system is not changing. How they calculate stats, how the stats are balanced, how the experience levels are gained, the back-end math of the system is not changing. And because the back-end system is not changing, they do not view that as an addition change. So at very best, this could be a 5.5 because the rules in and of themselves are not changing either you know five foot is still one square you know long are still going to do 1d8 damage they are releasing newer takes on existing classes 
but you don't have to use those at all if you don't want to. So to them, it's not an addition change, even more so. Which is exactly what 3.0 to 3.5 did. So I may have to get off the hill that this isn't going to be a 6 edition because they changed all the rules so damn much. Well, but I will say that it is very least 5.5. Yeah, it's 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 a 5.5 because they're not changing the rules. And I'm, I, I'm looking at this in the exact same manner as 3.0 or 3.5 because 3.0, 3.5 did not change any of the rules. Nothing changed there. They altered some of the spells that were a little broken. They tweaked some of the classes and the prestige classes. And that, that was the majority of it. So, you know, they re-released, they, they released a 3.5 book and just sort of went from there. And that's exactly what they're doing here. They, I, I don't know. Like it sounds. I, like... I wasn't. I wasn't playing during the 3.0 to 3.5 change. Mm-hmm. But was there this much hostility with the, how things had changed? Because I look at the stuff they're putting out for 5.5, the 2024 Players Handbook, as they're calling it, mm-hmm. and I'm like, I don't like any of these changes. None of this stuff makes sense. I know it's still not all written down in hardcore yet, and there's a couple things that seem good but they're just like gonna be variant rules that you could just not use anyways like like the the, the, like the glancing thing yeah there was no hostility that i'm aware of mind you yeah we didn't have the internet in in the capacity that we do now so but at least within the people i knew there wasn't really much hostility in the change from 3.0 to 3.5 because it it did nerf some spells because some of them were just too damn good and it okay. and it fixed I, I remember the ranger class it fixed it because it was just super underpowered uh, and it made it more comparable with a lot of the other classes and those are the only two major changes I remember I know there were some others but yeah probably yeah. Bal- probably balanced some of the feats along the way things like that but they're not doing anything in this book that seems to be an improvement you know like i i still have yet to see the warlock and they're kind of like taking elders blast out of being a cantrip they're moving into the core basic workings of the warlock yeah, which is okay. a big change that's a big change that, that sounds that sounds good that sounds like it's a really good change because it being a cantrip and everyone just choosing that as a cantrip it's pretty much just a wasted slot and it's kind of pointless so, yeah, everyone has Eldritch Blast. I get that. That's a good change, especially if they're going to start working around with it. They're making firearms and muskets martial weapons, and they're changing how weapon masteries work. Okay, that's something that needed to happen for a while. So, okay, that makes sense. Maybe not so much the firearms and muskets <laughs> change, but, yeah, you know, the gift are in the setting now, so you kind of have to. Yeah. You yeah. did that to yourself. <laughs> So uh, it, yeah, I, I, I just I, the, I don't I don't I don't I, I I don't know what they're trying to do. I don't know what their end goal is. If their end goal is to make the system easier to pull in newer players, which seems to be what I've read from this overview of the summit, that's what they want with all the DMG changes and the PHB changes they're having. That's great because you're growing the brand. But the problem is that I have now is that your game doesn't work after like CR 10, your leveling up creatures doesn't work after like level 10 or 15. Uh, the players just become too powerful. The campaigns just get derailed. So like, what are you doing to fix the end game? Because it's not just pull the new players in get them to buy books. And once they bought books and played a few games and go, Oh, that's really cool. And then their table falls apart and they never pick the books up again. If that's what you're shooting for, that that sucks. There's not going to be a future for it. We need to have more campaigns. We need to have more lore books. We need to have more information out there on how to run higher-end campaigns and stop just focusing on the low-end stuff. I can't, like, where's I, all I, this I, discussion? And it's not happening. I can't agree with you more in that aspect, but I've you know, harped about that for years on this podcast that they need the, more the more. only thing they said is because they're changing the weapons okay the monsters over cr10 are getting reworked but they didn't give any data as to what that actually meant like what, what do you mean reworked just you're giving them better weapons and a, a great club i was i just used two cr6 monsters okay and a cr10 monster 
And then a CR 15 monster in my Adventure League campaign a couple weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Out of those four monsters, three of them had great clubs. Yeah, because great club is good. <laughs> because great club is the only thing that giant monsters seem to use. Yes. So uh, is that what they're changing? You're going to say instead of a great club, you're going to say massive tree. Uh, like, I don't know. yeah, you're you're not like the weapons in five E are they're just bad. Let's they're just too be, simple. They you know. because because they all do the same thing. Uh, so that you have piercing, slashing, and bludgeoning. But those do not make a difference. Everything takes the same type of damage from every type of weapon. If they actually alter the monsters so that piercing, slashing, bludgeoning matters for damage resistance and immunities, then you can actually do more stuff with the weapons. But yeah, I don't know that they're going to. Uh, that's you know, that's kind of the least of my concerns, though, as far as this goes. Uh, I, I agree with you that they need to do a lot more for the higher end of the game and the balance of it, because characters do get very powerful very quickly in 5e. And I, for me, I'm a very experienced DM. I don't really care because I can and will alter my encounters. But for a not experienced DM, who's trying to run a campaign up to 10th or higher, that's going to be very difficult. Uh, I'm also going to see it as very much problematic for the uh, VTT that they're releasing. If you're, because I don't know the extent of what you can and cannot do within it, but if you're not able to alter monster stats, then the only answer for those higher level encounters is to just throw more fucking monsters at them. And so that's, that's a good for, way to wipe a party. From the the D and D Creative Summit overview that I read, the books and the data from the books are not being factored into the VTT. The VTT is just building a map, putting the minis on the map, and then activating special effects with the minis in the map. If and I was going to talk about this, but so we'll go ahead and get into it. If that's all that it's going to do, they're going to have a hard time selling this to people. Um, so one of the questions that was asked during the Creator Summit was somebody asking about people who have low-end computers and can they run it? And the response, and this the actual response was, is that something you would want? Yes, I want to be able to run my virtual tabletop on a fucking potato. <laughs> so, like, not everybody has three thousand dollar computers. We have friends who have. We have a buddy who has a five hundred dollar laptop who can't play a video game with us, and we need this. You know, like we need virtual tabletops to be able to run on that. <laughs> so, the data that they gave was is that the the VTT is not going to be a browser run application application. It's going to run as a desktop app. Okay. Fine. But you could, it's so to run on a low end computer. What that means is that if I'm going to be using D and D beyond VTT and it's not being based off of the web web and I have to run it, I'm using my computer now for not only running it, but also my browser with all my other stuff that I'm using, probably D&D Beyond. And I'm hosting this now to other people with the app who mm. are now connecting to my computer and I'm streaming it. It's a complexity oh. issue. Like it, I can do that right now with VT with, with uh, Foundry VTT, but there still are some hangups if I have a lot of maps and spell effects on there. Yep. So now you want me to host a giant 3D terrain thing that has animations and shit? Yeah, it's not going to work. Yeah. And on top of that, you're asking me now to have a very good internet connection to be able to host that off. When everybody was thinking that this was something that they're going to be hosting on their side, because why would I pay a monthly fee for a fucking desktop app? Uh, well, even more so than that, uh, just looking on Steam, typing in VTT, and there's a lot of them that pop up, but I actually looked at a couple of them. And there are two of them on here that are really fucking good. Uh, there is the RPG Engine and RPG Stories. 
And RPG Engine, I know at least within it, and they're both kind of early access, uh, so these may change, but the RPG Engine actually is, a lot of it is just fan-made, creator-made. They have a workshop on Steam where they let people make components that you can then throw into your games. Uh, yeah. R- RPG Stories is the same way. You can build out your world. You can build out all of your maps. You can make your little minis. And it does sci-fi and modern horror and all the other types of stuff. Mm-hmm. So, sorry, trying to get this, trying to get D&D to, they're going to do well, obviously, because it's Dungeons and Dragons. But there's competition out there that's probably already making a better product. And and on top of that, too, this essentially, to me, it just screams stims for your computer. Okay? So this is D&D Sims. You have to build your own house, your own dungeon, okay? You've got to populate it with your own monsters, and you have to pay a premium price for the Goblin Pack. That's $35 right there, you know? Mm-hmm. And then you have it on your computer, then you have to host it. It's... Or you can get RPG Engine for $20 or RPG Stories for $40 with no subscription fee and download what you want from their workshops. Or Foundry, you pay 20 bucks and get it forever. Yeah. Uh, now, this that all being said, this is the first time I personally, because I watched the video of them playing the, the VTT thing. You mean and, them sitting around a table oh, reacting yeah. to D&D Beyond with 30 seconds of actual VTT footage? It, yeah, but it was enough that I could see kind of what it looks like, kind of what it does. And let, let me just point out that while they're all sitting around the same table on a laptop, there was a giant map in the middle of the table with real dice on it. But why? What is what is wrong with this picture, people? <laughs> Well, that's that's the thing that I saw, too, is that D&D Beyond is not going to integrate with this VTT. It has to. If it doesn't, they're fucking dead in the water. <laughs> like, I can already do that with Foundry. Yeah. And you're telling me you're not going to be able to do that? Yeah, it has to, or they're fucking just done. Uh, so this is the first time I personally have actually looked at a VTT. And it looks like a fucking video game. It act, operates like a video game, plays like a video game. And I played Tabletop Simulator a little bit, so I at least had some familiarity with it. And I kind of like it, and I get it. I, oh, you know, yeah, I, it looks good. I, I, we've talk, I've talked about this shit ad nauseum. I cannot play tabletop games online. I, like, I've tried it, bored out of my fucking mind for most of it. but. Doing it like this with a virtual tabletop, if the story's good, if if I'm if it's a small group and I'm not getting constantly talked over audio wise, I could probably do this because this is very video game esque. It's it, it's not a online D and D game. It's not a video game, but honestly, it's something new. It's like a combination of the two, and I actually do have some interest in this. Now, I'm probably never going to touch the fucking D&D VTT, but if somebody uh, you know, down the road was running it in another one, I, I, I could consider hopping into something like that, at least trying it. Yeah, I mean, they'd have to make a better product than what's currently available out there mm-hmm. for everybody. And visually running you're just running through unreal 5 and anything that's currently coming out on unreal 5 looks visually better than other things that are on older engines oh yeah yeah yeah. but it's gonna take a pretty substantial computer to run it yep yeah like i I, I tried running the tabletop simulator i run it fine but several of the people who were trying to play with me couldn't run it at all and it's not going to be nearly as hard to run as this thing so you want to go a couple of questions that uh, that they recorded about uh, the VTT? Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah, let's do it. So the first question uh, was, will the new D&D Beyond and the associated VTT be homebrew friendly from a tools perspective? Will there be a homebrew marketplace? If so, will the content be monitored and will D&D Beyond be further monetized? Uh, in answer, response to D&D yes. Beyond... <laughs> and in response to D&D Beyond being homebrew friendly, an enthusiastic hell yeah. 
Well, it's currently not. No, no, it's not. Uh, the team highlighted their technical experience building third-party marketplaces within digital tools and wanted to enable homebrew content, but do not have a clear details about new features or a timeline for functionality beyond the existing, though limited, homebrew kit toolkit. So the homebrew toolkit currently on D&D Beyond lets you take either a completely blank slate or based off of a current existing item. So I want to build a goblin. So I get a goblin. Okay. It'll, it'll populate all the fields in the, in this web browser with all the goblin stats. And then I can modify and change any of the numbers and then I can save it. I can give it a title and give it a fancy picture and it will show up as my homebrew and I can publish it and other people can use it if they want to. I have a bunch of homebrew stuff up there, mostly stuff from Dread of the Ice Devil and uh, Everyone's Been Naughty, like the Santa Claus and the Krampus and mm -hmm. the NPCs that are there. They're all on there. You can find them on D&D Beyond. Without looking, I know a couple of them have been used over 100 times. So that being said, what infuriates me to no end is that if I allow my homebrew content to be used within a campaign because I want homebrew to be used, all of my homebrew content becomes used. So if I, let's say, created a very specific spell for a uh, warlock slash cleric drow that my wife played in one of her first campaigns and gave her this unique matron drow spell, mm -hmm. it now shows up for everybody forever that I play with using my, you know, shared D and D beyond account as a spell for them to use. Uh, and okay. they don't have any way of filtering content in any capacity on the, as D and D beyond stands right now. So if I don't want to include Theros information, there's no way for me not to include Theros information. Uh, got it. They, they need a much tighter search engine and, and kind of control on what is and is not allowed in your own game because i may create a spell for a monster but i don't necessarily want my players having access to that right so if you create a monster it shows up on your lists whenever you create encounters all of my monsters that i have now if i'm searching for a cobalt i get to all my variant cobalts that i've created pop up mm -hmm. yep and like that, that that's cool that it is does pop up for the builder but like that was that campaign, and I can't just link things to that campaign and that campaign only. Yeah. And they have stated multiple times that they cannot fix that Bullshit. or change that without a complete redesign of their back end. Bullshit. And, and I don't I don't think that they're wrong. Okay. I think that they built the D D Beyond back end without knowing everything that needed to know originally. Okay, so they would I, honestly I, have to to actually like, oh shit, we didn't intend for that to be there. Here's our patchwork that barely works on top of it. And we'd have to redesign everything for it to become better. But this is when you do that. Yeah, you're, re you're fucking designing a virtual tabletop to release to the mass masses to make a lot of money. So ne you need that shit to be fixed. And if that means reworking it from the ground up, fucking hire some people and do it. You've got billions of dollars, Hasbro. Like D and D Beyond, when they were before they were part of Hasbro, they stopped publishing the UA content on the site because it took developers too long to get the new UA content to work before the UA content was really kind of irrelevant to use before the new content came out. And then they had to basically redo everything once the new content came out. So if that took a huge amount of developer time, and that's what I would consider to be a simple task, their back end is really messed up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and it probably from, is. From, yeah. working, from working in that space, in the software development space, professionally i if, if if that is taking a long time and you have to ax it because it, it's it's it takes way too much man hours then either you have a very lazy developer 
don't think that's the case. Or your system needs to be completely reworked. And it, it, that could be they need maybe they need a D and D Beyond version two point Yeah, I was gonna say how long has D and D Beyond been out? Like a Since, decade? Yeah, than, about that. Yeah, so you're you're dealing with something that was created a decade ago when the VTT was yeah, they did they knew they were trying to do it because you said they're talking about it in fourth edition, but they had no clue what the fuck they were actually gonna do. Uh, so like they're just dealing with an old system. It it needs to be remade. Uh, they need to make it like you said a two point It's the only way it's going to work. So here's the next question. I think that well, I'll hang, read hang, off. Well, hang on, real quick. Uh, so if I created a spell, uh, you're talking about if this thing actually worked with the VTT and everything, I would create a fireball spell that every time you cast it, it would say "brought to you by Carl's Jr." It would just make your character <laughs> say that. <laughs> anyway okay moving on next question so the next question that that's relevant to to talk about is uh was asked dm's guild provides access to improved to approved ip for community creators who publish on that platform will this policy extend to D beyond marketplace response that's a great question we do need to think about that and then the comment from the, this author was this was not on their radar all right. Yeah. DM Guild works because you allow them to use people, the people. You allow the people to use the D&D branding with for 50% of the cost of the item. You give us a plat they, we have a platform. We have um advertisement that happens for free. Everything is handled through the website. And the cost to us creators is just 50% of the of the book price for each book purchase. It's a lot, but they handle a lot. And we have that the license content. We can there's a lot of artwork we can use. There's there's a lot of settings we can use. And they bring in the new ones when the new settings comes out. It's all 5e related or 4e related. Um so the fact that they haven't even thought about this for the D&D Beyond VTT homebrew is insane. Like literally insane because the homebrew area is like the core thing that's going to sell D&D Beyond. You're you're competing with your own product at this point in time. Yep. And so if your old product does something the new product doesn't do, they're not going to go to the new product. They're going to stay with the old product. Yep. Now, unless, unless you just kill the old product. If you just kill D and D DM's Guild and basically say, "Okay, our contract's over, we're not renewing it, you can't have people publish here anymore," then you're going to basically f face a mass hysteria and people not using their products anymore. Again, into the equivalent of the OGL stuff. Yeah, I, you would you would definitely have a lot of people who'd be incredibly pissed about that. Uh, I you know, like at the same time, it's still D and D. People would get over it. Um, you know, Overwatch Two came out and they killed Overwatch One. People miss Overwatch One a lot, but everybody still plays Overwatch Two. Well, so, that's because they took away Overwatch One. That's that, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. If you if you just get rid of the DMs Guild, but see so the thing is, is that they don't own DMs Guild. Eh. One one drive through RPG owns the M skill. Okay, okay. And they well, have that... a they have a license to basically well, let people that, use then. the IPs. Yeah. So uh who knows? Yeah. Uh so uh what is the publishing future of D D given the financial and resource investment into D D Beyond? What is the future of D D in print? D D Beyond access with physical release? Question mark? Uh, and the response was a very, very bright future. We're all committed to supporting that. It's a yes and situation. Yeah, that, we want you to buy the stuff once. Yeah, so, I, did, I heard about this. The, the plan is for them when you buy a physical copy, you get a PDF copy for free. That is what I have heard. Uh, who knows for sure? Uh, one of the one of the things that people were really kind of bitching about with this creator summit was 
they were asking these questions and then they would sort of get vague answers, uh, which that's, well, that's that, that, that kind of goes to the whole idea from what, from what I read, you gave me where this was supposed to be a summit, but it wasn't a summit. It was more of a product demonstration, right? Yeah. So they demonstrated the product and weren't prepared for Q and a, that's not what a summit is. A summit's where you the, go and the, discuss and talk things over. Right. The Q and a was supposed to be up to, it was supposed to be about an hour. And after about 20 minutes, they started to call it off because they were just getting fucking reamed. And then it ended up the, everybody sort of revolted. So it went like four hours, <laughs> which is way more than they were really prepared to answer. Um, it does say they mentioned the challenges of physical security with uh, providing codes in stores with books. Uh, at the moment, there seems to be no immediate plans for you to be able to purchase a book and also receive a digital copy. Okay, well, this you know all of the info that I'm hearing is not always right because I'm just watching YouTube videos. <laughs> uh, what are the technical requirements for the VTT? Our intent is a little different than where we are. Our intent is to play on any device that you have. Yeah, they spoke we broadly already... about the goal of having a VTT be compatible with as many platforms as possible and that it would be taking an agile and interactive approach. We already know that's some bullshit. God damn it, I hate agile. <laughs> as, you just hate it as a word? <laughs> Fuck no. agile. You, you, you don't work in corporate America no, right I, now. No, I, I know what you're talking about. I hate the I fucking hate corporate speak with a passion. No, the, agile it, is agile is a way I, of producing software quickly and effectively, and it's pretty much the main way people develop software nowadays. Oh, okay, so that's that's a little more technical. But the term agile in corporate speak is one of those buzzwords that doesn't properly have a meaning. Do you like sprints? Do you like scrum meetings? <laughs> Is there going to be a mentorship program or place and opportunities to get eyes on third-party content? Their answer is no. <laughs> of course not. Uh, how will they support LGS libraries and schools or they require an amount to run events? This is something that the team is looking into. They noted over 9.5 million students have participated in their school program, and they want them to continue doing this sort of work. And yet, Adventure League is still just dead. Yep. Yeah, they're not trying to grow it. Yeah, it's good that they're doing it in schools, but they're still not trying to grow it in, you know, small public spaces, as it were. So where are they now? The VTT is currently in a pre-alpha, and present, and they're presently focusing on playing, not creating. There's a brief roadmap they presented. In 2023, the focus will be supporting core mechanics, implementing intuitive player UI and play assist DM controls and increased testing feedback. 2024 will focus a shift to character and mini creation and counter a world building and a remixable content li library with and wider play testing. In 2025, they plan on some form of release, allowing people to use the same creation tools, share creations, engage in wider community feedback loop. Okay. So, um, this, so this isn't released till the VTT is in 2025. Yes. It looks okay. Like. So they've got a little while to hopefully fix this shit. So the key takeaways from the VTT discussion, um, play testing is open to Watsi employees and their friends, family. This will be extended to influencers and then some form of closed alpha beta. They don't have a uh, process outline for the closed alpha beta. No other RPGs are being considered for port into D and D beyond VTT. Uh, from a technical perspective, Unreal 5 will enable the team to eventually bring the VTT to consoles. I, I, I shifted my gaze to the side because I don't believe them. <laughs> the dev team has played the current build of VTT on a phone, unknown what type. Oh, yeah, come on now. The VTT will be a standalone desktop app and will not be available on a web browser. Boo. VTT is intended to be an ecosystem. You can use it for single combat encounter or tell an entire story with it. The demo showed at D&D Direct it is not the primary way they envision folks using the VTT. That's the video we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. The build shown at D&D Direct might be an old one. 
Regarding mechanic rules integration, you can do literally anything you want. You can play anything that has dice and minis in it. It won't have automation that comes with the D&D &D rules. So no automation with like the fireball hits and everyone takes damage and they lose health on their health bar. Right, which is this that is the selling point of this. No, they're saying that that's not going to be in there. I I know, but that's the selling point of it. If if I which roll... I which I mentioned I I know Foundry does that. Uh huh. Um, roll twenty does that, and the other one that I talked about that I can't remember off the top of my head does that right now. Yep. Yeah. And there was yeah. a question about representing marginalized groups in the VTT. Okay. What? <laughs> At the moment, they're still exploring how VTT content will be packaged with digital book purchases, if that ultimately happens. Okay, that was a weird segue. <laughs> um, uh, so, so, so yeah, oh, hold on, I want to read this. Oh, okay. Uh, this, um, the studio, this is Chris Perkins, Chris Perkins wrote that the studio's new process mandates that every word um illustration and map must be reviewed by multiple outside cultural consultants prior to publication cultural consultants are often used by companies to shield themselves from criticism is wizards also committed to including more diverse voices in the creative process furthermore are they committed to promoting or hiring marginalized people in decision making positions and they're on the product executive teams and the response was we want to hire the best people for the job a fantastic game designer does not make a cultural expert. I want to be clear about that. A person of color, and that's color with a U, does oh, not fucking br fucking British <laughs> does not necessarily mean that they are an expert in the broad academic experiences of people of color. Yes, we are absolutely always paying attention to the variety of represent representation questions and considerations within our workforce. Workforce. Um, I want to create a workforce and a workplace where a person of color or marginalized gender or disabled person can be a game designer and never discuss that part of them if they don't want to. Who, who does that now? When we talk about hiring consultants, we are making sure that we are engaging with people who are experts. Yeah, blah, blah, blah. It, it, it's, it's corporate answer to you know, just... It, it's more of the, the standard answer. Yeah. Nobody cares. Hire the best people for the job. Uh, hire who you want. I don't give a shit. Can they do the job? So the next the next part of the meeting was the one D&D &D rule set, and the presentation was by Jeremy Crawford, Chris Perkins, and Josh Harum. The presentation was called the 2024 Core Rules Revision. And is, <clears throat> is this where the, uh, the shit hit the fan? No, that was before. Oh, okay. This is uh, the second half where everything was fine. Okay. We'll we'll come back and talk to uh, talk about what Crawford said that pissed off a lot of people, even though it was nothing. Oh, we'll get to that. It's in, that's in here. Oh yeah, that's see, that's what I'm talking about. Okay. Okay. Uh, here are the here are the, the key design goals in the new player's handbook. They plan on teaching the reader how to play before to making their first character. The current PHB structure has largely been the result of tradition. Okay, whatever. The PHB is also has a rules glossary. It'll be similar glossary in the DMG that collects D&D &D lore to aid in understanding obscurities in the game. No, it won't. That's good. <laughs> no, it won't. The PHB will also include new game options. Clarity was not provided on this. The PHB will have all new art. Yay! Okay. I mean, I'm fine with that. Um, key, the first key piece of information. This is framed as a revision to the 5th edition rule set on emphasis on compatibility and conversion. This isn't 6th edition or 5.5. Yes, it so is. So if it's a revision, it's 5.5. That's exactly what 5.5 means. Yep. You know how you name files. <laughs> this isn't 5.0.1. You're making a whole new one. So this should really be 5.1. It should be, yes. It should be 5.1, but in D&D, &D, <laughs> that's not how we name things. <laughs> You will be able to open up your cursor strad and run it with the new core books. I might blow your mind with this next one. If you really want to, you also can make a character in the 2014 player's handbook with the options in Tasha's and Xanathar's and have that character at the same table as a character made from the 2024 books. Hold that on, is... hold on, hold on. 
are he actually said Tasha's and Xanathar's. He didn't say the was it Morden Canaan's, which is the one where they dumped everything into one book and adjusted shit. Correct. Uh, so so we can use the old shit, the things that actually aren't that bad. So okay. This is why I say what we're doing has not been done before for the game. Okay. Um. Then they then they asked about the monk. Um, they were asked about the monk, a class that has relied on Asian stereotypes, and this was Jeremy Crawford's response. How we're handling the the monk is connected to how we're handling all of the classes. And here's what I mean by this: the monk absolutely has to, has had that problem, and that has been something on our long list of things we're going to improve. In many ways, I think the core of the issue is that there's not enough non-European representation in the other classes. And so one of the things that we're doing is making it so that there's a non-European representation in all the classes. So that when you get to the monk, you no longer feel like, oh, it's this is the Asian class. And then we're doing the flip with the, with the monk. We're ensuring that there's a non-Asian representation in the monk. Are they going to have ox- are, are they going to have occidental haircuts and get robbed by the Vikings? <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> to go alongside this, key is being changed to spirit points to be more inclusive of other martial arts traditions around the world, and uh, <laughs> that that a lot of this content is subject to change due to community feedback. <laughs> like, I, oh my god, I'm just fucking dying over here. I want to play a friar. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> oh God, a ranger you're here. Take all my gold. <laughs> Hi, I'm a moil. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm I'm moil for a living. Just a little snip, for... just a oh, snip of the tip. The kids will love it. <laughs> <laughs> I got my next character now. <sighs> and this may just be because I'm just an adult white male, but. Probably, but uh, I, I just you saying that the monk is Asian stereotypes. I'm mean, like, yeah, the fighter okay. is the fighter is a fucking European stereotype. The barbarian is the, was the, the Gauls? German Saxon. Yeah, <laughs> all of them are like most of the fucking characters are stereotypes. No one cares. No one gives two shits. I mean, obviously someone does. I mean, oh, you well, got like I, I you mean, got like fucking ten people on Twitter who care because they don't have anything going on in their fucking life. Like nope. I have never been in a situation where I have sat down at the table and people are choosing their classes and they turn to the Asian guy and you're like, you have to play the monk because you're an Asian. Like yeah. that has never happened. Yeah. If that has ever happened at the table. That guy should just walk away because that's going to be this. That is like the, the tip of the iceberg there. Yeah. But yeah. Agreed. Like, if, that has never happened. I have never sat down at the end of the table and go, oh, you're you're Asian. You have to play um, the monk. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You're Filipino. OK, uh, you got to play the monk as well, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> uh, well, you're 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 not oh, you're white. Mexican. Yeah, All right, you're you're playing white. a drug cartel agent in this. So. Uh, it's not a spell jammer game. Like that doesn't happen. No, it, I've <sighs> never, I've never seen that, that happen. I have never fucking even heard of something like that happening. Now, if they, if they said that, Hey, we want to, we want to branch the monk out to include other, other traditions and other aspects of what a monk is and bring in more like Indian culture and traditions. Cause like, there's a lot of really good things we could pull from, from there that people use like the cannibalistic monks like yeah. that. That's that's got to be a subclass there, you know. Sure, but, but it, that's the prestige class. But the core class, I don't. You know how you change it so people don't think of it that way? You change the art. Yeah. You, you the the picture in the book make make it a white guy, make it a black guy. You make know, a have, tiefling. Have them dress in normal fucking you know, medieval clothing. Then the stereotype's fucking gone. Nobody's gonna think twice about it. Like changing key to spirit points, like okay, but that doesn't keys. I, I think key is probably a more Asian term. So if they want to get rid it of is. that, then okay, that's fine. But like, but you're still I, punching and kicking. You're still doing martial arts. 
for a living. Yeah. Like that, that, you know, everybody understands where it comes from. But no, but no one gives two shits about any of this. Anyway, oh, let's, ca- let's carry on. You're playing a monk. Your, your name is Jackie Chan. <laughs> What was a Family Guy joke where the where Peter kept going around Asian town and go, "Oh my God, it's Jackie Chan! Oh my God, it's Jackie Chan!" And then like one of the guys goes and looks at uh, Peter and he says, "Like, oh my God, it's some white guy." Yeah, yeah, just oh God, it's Brad Pitt or whatever who the fuck ever. All right, the new PHB. The new PHB will be bigger than a 2024 counterpart or 2014 counterpart. Uh, Twelve classes, forty-eight subclasses, and nine species. Though they have confirmed that this term is subject to change. Okay, so they're going to talk a little bit about species. Yeah, that term that that term is a bad term. <laughs> they have already they already basically took races, shoved it through their cultural sensitivity board, and they came up with you have to use species, which is oh, that's which so, that's so much has worse. Now, has now even before publication gone full circle, and they're saying that saying species uh, causes. Uh, exclusionary terminology to appear and we need to change it. This is why you shouldn't have groups like that in, in the organizations in general. That, yeah, it, it just... They haven't even published it yet and the, the cultural sensitivity board is already uh-huh. going, no, that's bad. That's bad. That's bad. No. Just call it heritage. Fucking move on with your day. Lineage. Lineage. Call it lineage. Call it heritage. Move on. Or you just... Call it race because we're all adults here. Yeah, or call it race because that's literally what it's been called since the beginning of D&D, and none of us adults give two shits. Uh, we new backgrounds, feed spells, equipments, and weapons. They're adding a lot more art for the aspect of the game, like backgrounds. Um, subclasses will be more distinct. Crawford mentioned a college of dance for the bard. Okay, let's go on past that one. Um, the team originally wanted to use lineage as a successor word for race, but the but John Tell's team, the, the cultural sensitivity board, and the inclusion <laughs> review process steered them towards species. Um, oh, so the, it is so, not set in stone. So, so the cultural board is the ones that made it worse. Yeah, because I, um, I I hear species, and I don't I don't really get offended so, by this kind of shit. But that just sounds so much worse. There's a video where they published about on one D and D, uh, where they're changing race to species and it's causing new problems from players. And then the comment was changing the term from race to species does not solve the underlying existentialism in D and D. If anything, this enables gamers to learn, uh, lean into the biological species concept to even further codify systems of oppression in their games. No one is codifying systems of oppressions unless they are also a super fucking racist in real life. Yep. Pretty, and you don't much. play games with that asshole. Pretty much. If 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 a racist, and I mean a legit racist, wants to fucking play D&D, then let them find some other racist assholes to play with. But yeah, most the vast, vast majority of people aren't racist. Most of us just want to get together, make up fantasy stories about not real individuals and play a game. Um, The PHP will have nine species, human, dwarf, halfling, goliath, dragonborn, elf, gnome, orc, and tiefling. Um, Here's here's your thing. Jeremy noted that the half-elf and half-orc aren't going anywhere. They just won't be in the revised edition and will live in a 214 player handbook in D&D Beyond. The team wants to focus on the orc and three elf variants that already exist in the books, which is fine. He said, frankly, we are not comfortable and haven't been for many years with any of the options that start with half. The half construction is inherently racist, so we simply aren't going to include it in the new player's handbook. If someone wants to play these character options, they can still use it in D&D Beyond. They'll still be in the 2014 player handbook. Um, so I expect the rules will be in place for custom ancestries like they mentioned in the associated Unearthed Arcana. Right. Okay, so let, let's talk about this, because this did make a big fucking stink uh, to the fact that legit news organizations were actually covering this. And it, Can't you stay out of the news for one goddamn month? <laughs> <laughs> it it really is nothing. So the, the words that Jeremy Crawford used, he, Jeremy Crawford's not a racist. He just said 
you know, half, whatever it was, half is, you know, uh, it's racist. And the terminology he used, he shouldn't have used it. He, you know, but just fucking move on. It doesn't matter. He didn't mean it the way that it came out. We all say yeah, stupid I, shit I, that we I don't feel, mean. I feel that same thing, too. He used the wrong word for trying to say what he wanted to say. Right. Now, it, for people who are upset that they are removing, and I, I say it in quotation marks, removing the ability to play a half-race character who's that's been coming for a while, and we even talked about it on this podcast a good while back. They're changing mm-hmm. the rules for character creation in simply the fact that you can just play whatever you want. You can put your stats however you want. They're they're making it so stupidly simple that anyone can build anything they want. So they're not yeah. actually they're not getting rid of half races. If you and your DM are okay with you making a half gnome, half halfling with plus two strength. The rules are going to allow that. Yeah, they're actually expanding the half, the half restrictions, and they're just not calling it half anymore. Right. And I so they I, don't I, need half elf and half orc because they can just have orc and elf. And then if you want to make your half orc half elf, you can. Yeah, you just tell me that you you and the DM say, well, okay, my one of my parents was this, and my other parent was this. All right, you're done. Yeah, you've got your half yep. race. And there's a module in DMs Guild right now that says an, orf, an elf and an orc had a baby. Go look it up and buy it. <laughs> That's the whole module. Fantastic. Uh, so <laughs> the, like the fact that this blew up, it's really it only blew up, I think, because of what he said. And yeah, once again, it, well, he didn't mean it. Everybody knows he didn't mean it the way it came out. So yeah, but you gotta be careful. I mean, I know people you know, like people get upset one, about stupid shit. That one interview he has where he messes up what he's trying to get across and people lose their minds. Yep. Leave my pen alone. It did nothing to you. Right. My cat is using bite attack against my pen. Damn. Poor pen. I know, right? Never going to survive. The next, the next UA barbarian fighter or monk will have new weapon options. Um, There's a lot of paragraph there. There's new stuff. We don't know what it is yet. They are... Um, adding new weapon mastery uh, properties. One is called Graze. It allows you to deal damage uh, of your ability modifier for the weapon, even if you miss. That's neat. Um, I'm, I'm all. F- I, I love options. You know this. I'm all for it. Firearms and muskets are now martial weapons. I actually still disagree with that. Like I, as I much as I a- like firearms. I don't think they should be martial weapons. They should always be like their own unique exotic weapon category. But I don't even, I don't even care because as a DM, I'm just not going to allow them most of the time anyway. But the must that historically existed well before the rapier did. So Dude. if you have a rapier in your game, you have to have a musket. Fuck you. It's my fantasy setting. I'll do what I want as the DM. <laughs> The fighter is being viewed as, viewed as a class that interacts with the most weapon with the most weapon masteries and testing. There's only one class that can shift weapon mastery properties around. Eldritch Blast is being built into the Warlocks instead of a spell. The new DMG will have more time and attention helping the DM prep for the first session of campaign with their players in a way that will facilitate fun and safe storytelling at the table. So this, uh, I, I read about this or heard about it a little bit back. I actually love that. Uh, yes. Because the the, there, DM, the DM's guide we currently have, it's fine for experienced DMs, but it is not particularly useful for somebody who's new to the game. Yeah, there will be a concept of session zero and safety tools included to root out to root them in the game's culture, and that's that's fine. I don't care. Right. You know, if if somebody wants to do their session zero, go for it. Um, yeah, but I mean, they're codifying rules for what a session zero should be. Yeah, that's which fine. I think is really good. Uh, given the weapon changes, the monster manual will have more. Most creatures over CR10 reworked. The monster manual will be the largest D&D has ever had, and will feature most all new art. They are focusing on adding high CR monsters and more NPCs. Uh, there was a mentioning of adding apex monsters that are over CR20. The new so, DMG will. Well, yeah, so epic monsters that's been around forever. <laughs> The new, new DMG will show the reader a campaign in order to help new players create their own. Uh, if you bought a book on D&D Beyond, you won't lose it with the change. However, you will not receive 2024 book automatically. 
Chris Perkins said that revised DMG will address three concerns from his fans, from the fans. I don't know what it, what it's in the DMG. I can't find what I needed in DMG, and I don't use it. And new larger typefaces. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm almost I'm getting up here in age. My my eyes are going bad, so I'm not going to complain about larger typefaces. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, overall, I think I think they are doing the best that they can do in these times to move forward with a new edition, and they're trying their best, yeah. but they are they they don't have a solid plan. It seems like, uh, they, like e- even the everything I read about the uh, creator summit was just very haphazard, and nobody really knew what was going on. Uh, the different teams, though. Yeah, and it's it's the left hand not knowing what the right hand is doing. Uh, there's a lot of that going on right now, and that's that's not good for business. So. Well, we'll see what happens, and ultimately, I think they'll get there. And once they start actually giving the next EUA and they actually get the next book out, so I think things will yeah. solidify more. Yeah, because the, the VTT thing. That can be a work in progress for years, and, and like you know, you release it, and then over the next two years, you work on it. That's fine. But when you release a, a final book, that shit's got to be right the first time. Because if you don't, well, then you get a you know sixth edition. <laughs> uh, but yeah, like yeah, that was a lot to cover. Um, yeah, a yeah. lot to cover, and it's just honestly a lot of that was just from that one guy's typing up of what he saw. I'm yeah. I'm not gonna hold a bad presentation, bad summit against them. I'm like, that can happen. You it was get egg in your face. Who cares? It was the first time they've done something like that. And from what I was reading, is like after the presentations were over, a lot of the PR people were going out and actually talking to the creators, trying their damnedest to get feedback on what they can do better next time. So I, you know, I that's what I want from the company is I want them to actually talk to the people who use their products and figure out what they can do better, what is wrong. And D and D and D and Watsi right now they've been shitting the bed so hard for the past couple of years that this that's what they need to be doing. So you know, it's a good Honestly, step in the right direction. It's a good step in the right direction. I think the next best step for them is honestly to take some. Take take a couple of groups of people, all right. Send them out all over the country, and even to some foreign countries. Go to a local LGS and sit down with the people that are there playing the game in the stores. Now I know that's not going to be the people at home, but you can't like really find that. Like, sure. Find yeah. out what's st- find out what stores are still actually playing games of Adventure League, okay? And talk to those people, okay? And then when the first person says, like, I don't really like playing D&D, but it's the only thing I play while it's here, stop listening to him and go somewhere else. Yeah, you're going to get some people who are just grumpy assholes, and then some people are going to give you good, solid feedback. And But you have to reach out to as many of them as possible, and you will get, so, the, you'll get the best feedback in a one-on-one conversation. And so, as much as I hate to say it, as much as I would love to be a part of the creator crowd that gets flown out there and stuff. Yeah, you fuckers, they, are, they, didn't, they didn't even call us. <laughs> didn't invite like, us nothing they're a good starting point but you can't stop there you can't sure. listen to twitter because that's just a loud fucking box of people yelling at each other yeah it's just an echo okay. chamber of assholes you can't just listen to to streamer creators who basically social media creators basically just use tiktok as a weapon against you all right Yep. Like Ginny D and uh, the D and D shorts guy did a lot of great work in spearheading the problem with the OGL stuff. That's mm-hmm. great. Okay. But you don't just listen to them now and stop. You know, there are a lot of people out there who have differing opinions on a, a lot of differing, different things. Go talk to them all. You talk to the, the, the social media creators. Now go talk to the actual people playing the game. Yeah. And, and you do, you need to talk Especially in D and D, you honestly you need to talk to large age ranges, uh, because I uh, I'm an older person, I'm an older DM, older game player, and my thoughts on the game are going to vary 
by comparison yeah. to what somebody who lives as an like say in an inner city uh, who is much younger than I am, we're going to have varying opinions on how things should be done. And hearing yeah. these different voices matters. And that's why, like, you know, if 6th edition is all, or 5.5 is just all about getting new play people into the game, that's great. Tell us that. And we won't buy your product. But know why we're not buying your product because we want more advanced stuff because yeah. we've been playing this for years. Yeah, I'm not going to buy their product as it stands anyway because it doesn't have anything I want in it. So I, I know there's a lot of people out there who are just looking for tables to play games. And there is one tool that can help people with that from WotC. You want to fix your game? You want to get more people playing? Fix those tools. Make them easier for people to go find a game. Yeah. Right now in my store, I have to create a fucking Facebook page and talk to all the LGSs to get them to run Adventures League. For you, WotC, you should be doing this. You, know, you I, have the WPN network anyways. You set up Friday Night Magic. We'll set up freaking, bring back freaking D&D Wednesdays. You yeah. got to do this. Not us. Yeah, they, there's no reason that they couldn't have put together some sort of a uh, quote unquote social media thing that's D&D specific to help people find each other and to find games. Okay, so I know this episode is running long. I'm sorry. Uh, we're, I, we're, like, we're, like, we're like 15 minutes late. That's fine. I have a serious freaking gripe about this right now because a little while, a little while ago, they contacted our, my game store and said, hey, you're the only game store in the area running D&D. That's not true. We're just the only one on the WPN that, that shows uh, Adventures League. We want you to run um, a learn to play D&D session. We'll send you some materials. They sent us a bunch of really cool things, like little dice bags with the D&D logo on it. They sent us these huge posters, and they sent us, like, the beginning of the new starter box set, when the starter set, like, just came out, okay? So it was basically, like, pre-made characters on flip cards and the first couple sessions of the uh, Dragon Storm, Storm, Storm Red Keep. And I ran a learn how to play D&D &D and a learn how to DM session off of that information. Uh, and a year later, with the movie coming out, they come back to the stores and like, hey, hey, stores, hey, we want people playing D&D. &D. We need you to host sessions. Oh, OK, cool. Um, like, we'll send you the materials. You just got to range the times. Everything on the 8th. You, you just run games all day on the 8th. All right. That's what we'll do. Cool. You're going to send us the material? Awesome. Great. So I couldn't be there out of state filming LARP commercials. The guy who was filling in for me, he picks up the material to run the new players through. And now on D&D Beyond, all right, D&D Beyond also was promoting this. Learn to come play D&D. &D. All right. Go to your local LGS and play Prisoner 13. For the from the all new movie Dungeons and Dragons: Honor Among Thieves, see Prisoner Thirteen and infiltrate Rebels End and learn how to play. Okay. Kick fucking ass. You're tying in the movie with Rebel because of Rebels End to um the game, and there's also going to be everything else that kind of goes with it. Yeah, Rebels End is a pretty cool setting. So. Right. Hold your brakes. Actually, <laughs> actually, we're just sending out the same exact kit we sent out a year ago with the, the starter set. And the actual learn to play is just a 30 minute demo encounter for Voyage to the Stormwreck Isles that you already have in the store. And we're just sending you that again. Wow. That's that's my only response to this. Wow. Good job, Watsy. So you can run Prisoner 13, but we're not giving you that material. You got to buy the book. Oh, my goodness. Oh, hey, I hate giant corporations so much. Like, 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 seriously, 
I mean, that's the best they could do. That's the best you could do. Best we can do is you run the shit that you already own, but we'll call it something, you know, tie it in with a movie. You... And like, I, I messaged the guy. I was like, no, I think you got the old one because the old one was that this is a new one. This is prisoner 13. And then I called up the store. It's like, did you give him that? It's like, yeah, I gave him. It's like, I really don't think it's the right one. Maybe they sent the old one just in this mistake. So she called up the WPN and they were like, oh, no, no, that's the right one. Um, the version of 13 stuff is just, if you want to do that to, to tie into with the movie. Seriously. Did you just have extras lying around and in, in such a mouth? You're like, Hey, let's just send these out again. Yes, they like, probably did. So, this blew my mind. It made me so mad. Because I look like an ass because I didn't, like, see the difference, okay? And I had yeah. the store freaking out because, like, oh, my God, is that, that's not the right stuff. They're not going to learn how to play. And, I mean, it, nothing's wrong with Storm Rack Isle. It's great. The, the, the intro stuff works really well. But there's no tie into the fucking movie then. Like. Yeah. It's... I don't know. You made $71 million. I'm kind of glad that fucking Mario was stomped the shit out of you. <laughs> I, look, I, I hope that they do very well with the movie. Um, Seventy one well, million done. dollars. Yeah. I, well, people still see it like you, you'll have to see it. But yeah, the seventy one million dollars, that's opening weekend. Uh, yeah, I'm sure it'll make upwards of one hundred million. But uh, I hope that's I hope that's good money for them. I hope it's enough to keep them making movies. Hold on, hold on. Let me, let me double check. Uh, Super Mario Brothers Super Show, Dungeon and Dragons Honor Among Thieves domestically made another fourteen point five million. Okay. John Wick Chapter Four got point one million more, so it was second place. And the Super Mario Brothers Super Show movie got one hundred forty six point four million domestically. <laughs> Oh, it doubled. They? It doubled D and D's. Yeah, but it's Mario Brothers. Yeah, you you, you can't hold them. like no one's gonna look. Like, yeah, yeah, like Dungeons and Dragons. There's a lot of kids that are not gonna go to see that. But the fucking Mario movie, you can take your fucking six year olds to see it all day long. The Super Mario Brothers Superstone movie. Yeah. Yep. But all right. Well, I think. Hey, we... yo, we're not Italian plumbers anymore. Yep. Why not? Because Mama now we're Mia. Chris Pratt. I'm gonna go stomp a Goomba. Do, 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 do. We're out. <laughs> Bye, Craig. Bye, Chris. Fucking Goombas everywhere. Get him with the turtle shell. Luigi, we gotta go.